Uh, okay, I guess the broadcast is live now. Um, so welcome to uh, I guess live with the Kavli Foundation. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Albin. I'm a science program officer at Kavli, and I'm here today with two researchers uh, who were funded in part by the Kavli Foundation and also the Kavli Institute in Neuroscience at Yale. And they're going to talk a little bit about a really interesting research project um, that was, I guess, happening uh, during the summer as part of a summer student um, program. So first, um, Raphael, do you want to sort of introduce yourself, kind of kick off the uh, the idea of the research and what your role was in it? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raphael Perez, and I'm a postdoc in uh, IEL, and I am also a Kavli fellow. And um, our lab, the Pijoro lab, which is where this research has, has been conducted, we're really interested in addiction. And one of the things that we're trying to understand is uh, opioid addiction and finding new ways to try to treat opioid addiction. So the current project, which Gloria is going to give us more detail about, has to do with how the environment controls tolerance to opioids. And this is based off a observation that's more than 40 years old, um, showing that when um, users use opioids in within a particular context or a particular environment, they actually develop tolerance to the effects of these drugs. So whatever the drugs are doing, whether that might be relieving pain or in a more um, perhaps recreational setting, um, you know, that rewarding effects and ultimately that decreasing uh, respiration, as they take more of the opioids, those effects go away. So what tends to happen is that people would and uh, take more and more opioids to kind of like get the same effect. So this is why it's known as tolerance. However, one thing that happens is that when users go to either an unfamiliar environment or a place that's not associated with taking the drug, then um, that tolerance can actually go away really quickly, uh, which is actually kind of astounding because our understanding of tolerance is that this is a biochemical or a physiological process um, so seeing that somehow the environment is inducing or creating memories that are able to completely change your body's response to a drug almost instantaneously, it, it, it was quite shocking to see that. And something that's also kind of strange is that there's not really a deep understanding of what are the mechanisms within the brain um, that are actually leading to this environmental control of tolerance. So the thing that I've been doing for the past two years is trying to figure out how to set up a paradigm using mice where we can study that. And now we have actually done um, a lot of work trying to finally start getting at what is the uh, underlying brain regions, the circuits, uh, and the mechanisms that are actually leading to tolerance. And um, we're doing some, we have done some strides into that direction. Uh, another realm or another branch of this project that we think is very, very important is actually trying to figure out what are uh, some potential alternative non-opioid based uh, pharmaceutical options or treatment options that we can use to try to change tolerance, particularly to the effects, the analgesic effects. And um, one of these uh, compounds is something that Gloria actually worked through throughout the summer. So. Um, I'd like to introduce her. Gloria is a rising uh, junior uh, from Yukon, and she spent um, the summer working with us on a very interesting project as part of the uh, Yale Surf program, which is a summer internship. So I will just let her uh, talk about her experience. Thank you, Raf. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Gloria Chum, and I was part of the Yale Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program this summer. Um, and I worked in the Department of Psychiatry and I conducted my research in the Picciato lab. Um, as Raf mentioned this summer, I looked at nicotine to see if it could change uh, fentanyl tolerance. Uh, so we looked at nicotine because we know two things about nicotine. Uh, first, nicotine can act as an analgesia, meaning it can help um, relieve pain. And the second reason is that at low doses, nicotine can help um, promote a new memory um, and enhance relearning. So we thought that if we paired nicotine with fentanyl, it can help create a new association with the effects of the drug. Um, it'll almost be as if the tolerance developed through learning 
will be forgotten and the new association um, created through relearning due to nicotine will help um, bring back the analgesic effects um, of the drug. Um, so my hypothesis was to test if nicotine can help decrease fentanyl tolerance um, due to nicotine's prolearning and analgesic enhancing effects. Um, so to test my um, hypothesis, I came up with a uh, training that will help induce tolerance in male mice. Um, and so I conducted my um, experiment in two different contexts. So if we can just bring up the first picture. Um, yes, yeah. so in context A, the mice received fentanyl and in context B, the mice received saline as our control. Um, and we were hoping that by giving them nicotine, um, it can help eliminate the association in the opioid paired context by creating a new association. Um, and it, always, it will be similar to um, giving the mice fentanyl in the saline environment where uh, tolerance was reversed. Um, so after uh, administering either fentanyl and saline, I used thermal nociception as a measure of analgesia or tolerance by placing the mice on a hot plate with a temperature of 56 degrees Celsius to measure their pain response. Um, so after 14 days of um, inducing tolerance, we found out that um, half the mice, about half the mice received um, developed tolerance um, and the other half were not able to respond to the training. Um, so we went on to then test nicotine to see if it can have any impact in the um, the tolerant or non-tolerant mice. So if we can go to the second picture. Um, yes. Um, so after, so I administered to half the mice nicotine and its vehicle, which was just saline, um, 15 minutes before administering fentanyl. Um, and we found out that a single dose of nicotine um, had no impact on uh, fentanyl tolerance. Um, however, we did find that uh, stress uh, played a big role or had an impact in decreasing opioid analgesia. Um, and we believe that this was possible because uh, during training, um, so in the picture it shows you during training, I uh, partly scruffed the mice and administered fentanyl subcutaneously, um, which just means into the mice back. Um, however, during during testing, um, we fully scruffed the mice and we administered nicotine um, interperitoneally into their gut region um, 15 minutes before administering fentanyl. So we believe that the, uh, the new introduction or the new method of injection caused stress on the mice, um, which is why we saw a difference in their nociceptive behavior when we placed them on the hot plate. Um, so some Future directions with these uh, with this experiments will be to test the hypothesis that multiple injections of nicotine um, can help st strengthen and promote relearning and a new memory in the opioid paired context. Um, so in that way, it it might be effective in impacting um, tolerance, fentanyl tolerance. Great. Um, yeah, no, this is this is really exciting. And I, I I love the fact that what what so often happens, I think, in, you know, in research is that you're testing one thing, but then find out something else, you know, really cool, that's important and plays a role. Um, so it's, yeah, great. Um, I guess if anyone has any questions, you know, please sort of chat them um, at us. Uh, I, I sort of had a, a general question that I'm sure you probably get asked a lot about. So most people have heard of naloxone, which is uh, pretty effective at reversing an opioid overdose. Um, so given that naloxone exists, why is it still important uh, to be studying things like opioid tolerance, you know, as a way to prevent overdoses in the future, you know, given that, again, we have this, you know, pretty effective drug already? So I think that's a that's a very important question. And um, so the thing about naloxone is that by the time you administer naloxone to someone, usually that's an active overdose. So it's a very critical period where if you don't get to them in time, <clears throat> you're gonna have lethality. But what we're trying to do here is we're trying to uh, address the potential lethality way earlier on when people might be taking uh, these opioid drugs to deal with pain 
and trying to figure out a way that if you can give someone a medication that can decrease their tolerance to the analgesic component of opioids, then maybe they can start taking less. So instead of taking, let's say, 800 milligrams of Vicodin or whatever, you can drop that down and that will actually decrease the risk for um, developing an opioid use disorder and eventually the, the overdose. So we're thinking uh, about this more as a prophylactic or something that you can take like once a month, like a preventative, trying to change the uh, the context too. Another thing about naloxone that's uh, very important to consider is the fact that when, because naloxone is an opioid receptor blocker, uh, an antagonist, when you give someone naloxone, they, um, they might immediately go into withdrawal, which is a very traumatic, very difficult um, experience. So you're creating a lot of suffering, even though you are saving lives. So if we can find a way that we can use non-opioid based medications, then maybe that can be a better alternative. Also, um, this might be something that people in more of those harder to reach communities, like rural communities, um, might be able to have that, you know, instead of something that might be more difficult to access, which naloxone can be in some of these places. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess, um, Gloria, um, I was wondering if you could just share a bit about, you know, your summer experience and how it um, sort of impacted what your next steps are. So you're going back to, to college, you're going to be a junior, you know, what are your future plans? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am right now a junior uh, on the pre-med track for medical school. Um, however, I wanted to get research experience this summer. So I, through the sum, the Yale SURF, which is a summer undergraduate research fellowship program, I was able to uh, be placed in the Picciato lab um, and with Raphael, uh, where I had an amazing research experience. It was actually my first time doing research. And I think he was an amazing mentor to help me go through um, you know, the steps um, of, you know, living as a researcher and just conducting experiments. Um, I also had an amazing um, experience with my cohort that I was with um, during my time at Yale. Um, it was amazing to meet and um, talk to other students who from diverse backgrounds who were also interested in pursuing a career in um, research. Um, so I also learned through this program, um, uh, the program, the MD, MD PhD program. I never knew about it prior to this program. So I didn't know there was a, a program like that. Um, but now that I do know, I tend, I want to uh, have more research experience to see if this is what I really want to do, if it's the MD and the PhD together, or if it's just the MD. Um, but as of now, yes, I just need to get more research experience. And I'm so grateful uh, to the Cavley Foundation for funding me to be able to have this amazing experience um, with Raphael and the Picciato Lab, and also just working on this project, which I think is very important um, for our um, society right now. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and I'm so glad you were able to have this, you know, this type of research experience. Um, I think it will help you out no matter what, if you do both the research MD, PhD, or if you just go straight medicine, I think having that background will will really um, allow you to be more effective, at, you know, whatever you decide to do. Um, oh, here we have a question. Okay, are you also interested in fundamentally different analgesic drugs? Uh, so 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 um, the short answer is yes, but not at the moment. Um, so one of the things that I want to do in this project, because we have found that the more we do, the more opportunities and the more questions we're beginning to ask. And like every time we find, uh, we make a new discovery, it just opens the door for like five different things. So I'm hoping that I can use this to be the launch pad for a future lab. Um, uh, so, but at the moment, we're trying to figure out because opioids are the most highly used pain medication, or one of them, we're trying to figure out because we already have this uh, population that's using opioids, what is going on here when it comes to the context. But um, so, tolerance, something that's interesting about analgesic tolerance is that it doesn't just happen for opioids, there are other things that have been investigated in so like calcium channel blockers or even nicotine in the past have been investigated as um, potential analgesics 
Um, but they also display tolerance over time mm -hmm. at different rates uh, and at different intensities. So there is something fundamental about your body's reacting to a tolerant uh, or an analgesic drug that is changing the tolerance. So eventually everything's going to become less effective. And I think it has to do with the fact that your body wants to be in balance. So your pain perception is your, you know, your alarm system. And now you have something that's muffing your alarm system. So you just dial the volume up to try to increase that. So I think that even though we're not directly looking at other drugs, the discoveries that we're doing now might be able to help in guiding the development of other drugs by figuring out how we can prevent tolerance. Yeah. No, no, exactly. I think so many things that we learn in, in different species and in different systems are transferable knowledge. So, um, but it is very exciting that there are so many possible avenues of, of research that, you know, you can follow um, and eventually do in your own lab. Um, I guess what people might be curious, like, what is your timeline for when this story might be written up and, and published? So, um, we're still doing some experiments. So one of the things that Gloria is actually going to work on um, uh, too is also that we have been conducting whole brain analysis where we can look at activation patterns across the brain. And that is actively ongoing now. It's very preliminary. But one of the things that we find is that um, you can basically recreate the mouse, ex the mouse experience by looking at what areas are activated. So we find that the areas that are the most activated have to do with pain, with reward, with um, movement. So basically, these are mice that all we did was change the environment where they were in. And somehow that was enough to change the activity of many brain regions across the entire brain. So each one of those areas could be a potential avenue. Um, but, and we're going to be pursuing some of the biggest targets within that. So we're looking probably, hopefully by next year, we'll have a preprint and then we'll have a, a manuscript uh, ready to go. But I, I very much, we want to have this done by next year. But, you know, science is it's a slow process. We have to replicate things and we want to check. Um, but we definitely have some very exciting preliminary work going on now. Um, but that said, we have plenty of work uh, that is ready, at least for presentation. So, you know, I'm excited to take this on the road and see what people think, because I think one of the good things about being able to present your work or talk about your work is that people can be a participant. So you go and you talk about your science and then people say, well, have you considered this? If you wait until the paper's already published, then you say, I didn't consider that and now it's too late. Um, yeah, no, it sounds great. I mean, it's, you know, a paper probably in a year or so, but in the meantime, you know, if anyone, it sounds like if you're offering, if anyone wants to, you know, invite you to, to come talk about your work, um, you know, that you'd be more than happy to, um, for sure. So, um, yeah, I guess, you know, we've, we've been on for, um, you know, our, our 15 minutes. So, um, if anyone has any sort of last comments, uh, we can say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, um, the last thing I want to say is I, I also want to thank the Cavley Foundation for the opportunity, um, too. So as I mentioned, we're doing this whole brain analysis, and that is the kind of experiment that I was able to pursue because we got uh, I got research funds. So that's a more risky question that we're able to do. So, I, yeah, I also just want to take the time to say thank you to the foundation for their continued support. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank um, you for having hopefully us. I'll see you sometime at a conference somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.